Hi everyone and welcome to another crime and punishment story. This week I am covering the story of Richard Charlton and the murder of his wife Sarah at Dinnington at Northumberland in 1875. But before we begin can I just say if you do enjoy this video then please give it a thumbs up and if you are new here or haven't already done so then do please consider subscribing to the channel to help support the content we create. Thank you. I would also like to add that I had planned to get some location photos last weekend but due to unforeseen circumstances I wasn't able to do so so I have had to add some maps of the area in place of the photos that I had hoped to get. Richard Charlton was born in around 1848 in Elsdon, Northumberland to parents Michael and Anne. He was one of at least eight children. He had married Sarah Fenwick in around 1873 at Newcastle and the couple had one known child, a boy called Henry. Richard worked as a farm labourer and at the time of the crime he was living separately from his wife. Sarah Charlton, the victim, was born in around 1850 in Dinnington, but this may also have possibly been Erzden, to parents William and Sarah. She was one of at least four children. Sarah's father William had been a farmer who employed several people on his farm and it was here where she had first met Richard. It was said that when it was discovered that she had married him, the couple had married in secret, many thought she had married beneath herself as she was apparently quite a wealthy woman, her father having died in 1866 leaving £2,000 which had been shared between the sisters. Sarah was said to have around £300, which today would be around £44,000. The farm at the time Sarah met Richard was run by her sister and her husband. The newspaper articles covering both the inquest and the trial have been quite confusing at times with some wildly different stories about this case, so I have done my best to make them make sense. Richard and Sarah had been married for a while and were living together in Dinnington Village. Sarah, who was pregnant, moved out of their home and went to stay at the home of her sister at Gardner's Houses. This is now known as Gardner's Houses Farm, but in 1875 the farm part was not included in the name. It was suggested that she had gone to stay with her sister so she could be taken care of until the birth of her baby. Richard had stayed with her until early April and after their son was born he had gone back to their home alone. Sarah did not want to go back to their home. Some reports suggest this was because she had been fed up with her husband's drinking and asking her for money all the time and that he had also been abusing her but some reports say there was no clear reason why she did not want to return and that there was no evidence of abuse. But whatever the reason, between April and June, Richard had frequently asked her to return, but she always refused. And on June the 5th, 1875, Richard went to visit her at her sister's home, and it was said that he arrived around 5am and asked to see Sarah. He was told that she was not yet awake. It's not clear where he went after this, but he seems to have stayed in the area, but the family thought that he had returned to his own house. So the family went about their day-to-day -day business. Sarah, two of her sisters, a lady by the name of Mrs. Robinson and one young servant girl by the name of Jane Lennon, were in the house. Sarah and Jane were alone in the kitchen and at around two o'clock Richard came in. He had at first asked Sarah how she was but she had not replied. He then took hold of her arm and asked her, are you going to return? To which she replied, no, I will never go back. At this point, Richard took out a revolver and fired at his wife. However, the shot missed her. He then put the gun much closer to her head and fired again, and Sarah immediately fell to the ground. Her sisters rushed into the kitchen to see what was wrong. Richard then fired at Sarah's sister, Anne Robson. However, this shot only grazed her cheek. He then attempted to shoot Sarah's other sister, Mrs. Bennett, but this shot missed her. The two sisters ran into the pantry and closed the door. 
which Richard tried to force open, and shooting at the door, he wounded Anne Robson in the hand. He then went outside and tried to get to the sisters through a window, but Anne had closed the shutters. He then returned to the kitchen, where Sarah was still lying on the floor, and placed the gun to his own cheek and fired. The police and doctors were sent for, and Dr Heath and Dr Jameson arrived some time after 3pm. On examining Sarah, it was clear to them that she would not survive her injuries, and she died at around 1am on the Sunday morning. Richard's wounds were also felt to be fatal, and at first it was thought he would be sent to the Newcastle Infirmary, but it was felt he would not survive the journey, so he was taken back to his own home the following day, where he was watched over by the police, with the doctor visiting frequently to check on his condition. condition. Richard was not well enough to attend the inquest which was held at Gardner's houses on Monday afternoon. It was stated that the couple were not thought to have had a happy marriage, married after knowing each other only a few weeks with many disagreements mentioned, and it was confirmed that Sarah's family did not approve of the marriage. It was said that Richard had wanted the money that belonged to Sarah to be transferred to him for his own use. However, Sarah had always refused to do this, and it was believed by the family that this had been one of the main causes of their separation. Sarah's sister, Anne Robson, spoke of the afternoon when Richard came into the home, given the same details as covered earlier in this story. It was hoped that she would make a full recovery from her injuries. However, there were fears for the health of Mrs. Bennet, as it was said that she was of a nervous nature, and it was thought the trauma may cause her long-lasting problems, if not worse. She did not give evidence, however, her condition was not mentioned again, so I do not know if she ever recovered or not. Mr Watson, a labourer at the farm, said he had entered the kitchen shortly after the incident and he had found Mrs Charlton lying on the floor and her husband lying beside her. He said he had seen the revolver which was lying close to Richard, and it was also he who had found the bullets in a bag in Richard's pocket and given them to the policeman. He said that both Mr and Mrs Charlton were alive when he first arrived. It was said that Richard's self-inflicted gunshot wound had left him with a bullet lodged at the back of his brain. Although it had not killed him, he was not expected to make a full recovery. It was believed that the revolver had been recently bought by Richard, but for what purpose seemed to be unknown. Also in his possession, as already mentioned when he had been found, was the bag containing another 36 bullets, which suggested that he had planned to shoot more than just his wife. The doctor stated that the cause of death for Sarah Charlton had been the gunshot wound to the head, causing bleeding to the brain. The doctor did discuss being unable at first to find the bullet. It had lodged deeply inside Sarah's brain. Deputy Chief Constable Taylor said he had arrived at the farm a little after 8pm, he found Sarah Charlton lying on the sofa in the living room and Richard Charlton lying on a mattress on the floor of the kitchen. He had found two bullets, one lodged in the pantry door and another near the door, and he said that Richard was already in the custody of three policemen when he arrived. The jury at the inquest very quickly found Richard Charlton guilty of willful murder in his absence and he was committed for trial. However, it was not known at the time if he would ever recover enough to actually stand trial. He had apparently made some slight recovery and was still at his home in Dinnington under the guard of the police. On Monday, some articles state a Wednesday, after the inquest, Sarah Charlton was buried at Erzden Churchyard. I was not able to find any further details of the funeral. For those listening who know the local area, this may seem strange as Erzden is quite some distance away from Dinnington. However, both of Sarah's parents are buried in Erzden Churchyard and also some of her other relatives. Her father had actually been born in the area. So I have to assume that this was seen as the family burial place and this would be why Sarah was buried there. 
I did find details of a headstone for her parents, however, I found no details of any headstone for Sarah. Richard, it would seem, was a lot tougher than the doctors had thought, and having made steady progress, by the end of June he was taken from his home in Dinnington to the prison infirmary at Morpeth. It was stated that his left side was paralysed. It was clear that although he had now been formally charged with the murder of his wife, he would not be fit enough to stand trial at the summer assizes, but was expected to be well enough for a trial later in the year. The trial did eventually take place in early December of 1875 at the Moot Hall in Newcastle. Richard was still very unwell but seen as being fit enough to attend. Due to his injuries, he had to be supported by two of the prison warders as he was still unable to stand on his own, and after responding with a not guilty plea, he was then allowed to sit down for the duration of the trial. Anne Robson gave the same evidence as that which she had given at the trial, only adding that prior to June the 5th, Richard had been to her house many times to see his wife and son. She said he lived about 20 minutes walk away from her home and until the last time all of his visits had been quite brief and friendly. Jane Lennon, who worked at gardeners' houses, said she had been in the kitchen when Richard had arrived. She said he had asked his wife how she was and asked her if she would return home. She said she had heard Richard Sarah say that she would not. She said she saw Richard take the revolver from his pocket, but she did not see him shoot Sarah as she ran outside as soon as she saw the gun to go and find some help from the men employed on the farm. She did not believe that Richard was drunk when he arrived at the farm. Jane Robinson, who lived at Blythe, said she had been visiting Mrs. Bennett at Gardner's houses. She said she had heard a man's voice in the kitchen. She had looked inside the kitchen after hearing screams, but as she was holding Sarah's baby in her arms, she decided it was best to get out of the house. She had said she had come into contact with Richard as she had been leaving by the front door. He had a revolver in his hand, but he did not shoot at her, and she kept running away from the house. She said she returned to the house later when she knew it was safe to do so, and saw both Mr. and Mrs. Charlton lying on the floor in the kitchen. Mr. Watson gave the same evidence as he had done at the inquest. Mr. Pyle said he worked at a pawnbroker's in Newcastle and in June 1875 a man dressed in a grey suit and a felt hat came into his shop and asked to look at some revolvers. He had bought one and then asked where he could buy bullets for it and was told of local shops that sold them. He had also asked how to load the gun and Mr. Pyle said he had shown him as best he could without any actual bullets. He could not, however, identify the man in the dock as definitely being the same man who bought the gun. Dr. Galloway said he had examined Richard Charlton and believed the bullet from the gun to still be lodged in his brain. There were no signs of any exit wounds and he said that it was quite normal for a wound to the right side of the brain to cause paralysis to the left-hand side of the body, as was the case here. Deputy Chief Constable Taylor gave very similar evidence to that which he had given at the trial, only adding that he had seen Richard Charlton a few times since the arrest, and he believed him to be recovering well. P.C. Davison said he was stationed at Dinnington and had gone to Gardner's houses on the 5th of June, arriving at around 4.15pm. He had found Richard lying in the kitchen with a wound to his head, and he saw Sarah Charlton lying on the sofa, and she also had a wound to her head. He said that he had been the one to formally charge Richard with the murder of his wife several days later, and he said that he had not replied to the charge, but by this time he had been fully able to do so if he had wished to. Isabella Swinney, James Stobart, John Richley, George Fenwick and the Reverend Prescott all spoke of having known Richard for several years, and they all found him to be a quiet, kind and inoffensive man, who they believed to be sober and always kind to his wife. It was mentioned once or twice at the inquest and the trial that Richard was known to be a sober man, 
This was perhaps because his wife's sisters had stated previously that he had been a heavy drinker, and it's also possible that they believed he wanted Sarah's money to buy drink. However, I found no real mention of him being drunk on the day the crime was committed. The Reverend Matthew Churton, the vicar at the church at Dinnington, said he had known Richard for five years. He said he also believed him to be a kind, sober and quiet man. He went as far as to say that he knew this to be correct. However, the judge pointed out to him that this was only his opinion and not a fact. Richard did not give any evidence. The defence then stated that had Richard succeeded in killing himself as well as his wife, would the jury have not then returned a verdict of temporary insanity, and that they were in the mind that this was indeed the case here. They said it was, however, for the jury to decide whether or not Richard had known what he was doing when he shot his wife, attempted to shoot her sisters, and then shot himself. They must ask themselves, did he know at the time the difference between right and wrong, as there seemed to be no clear motive other than temporary insanity. The jury retired for only a few moments before returning a verdict of guilty of willful murder against Richard Charlton. Richard was asked if he had anything to say as to why sentence of death should not be passed, to which he replied, no. The judge then sentenced Richard Charlton to death by hanging and that his remains would be buried within the grounds of Morpeth Prison. He was then removed from the dock and taken back to Morpeth. On the 10th of December, a public meeting was held by the residents in Dinnington and the surrounding area in favour of a petition to the Home Secretary to commute the sentence to one of penal servitude for life. It was felt that due to his injuries he was not expected to live for long and that he had a previous good character that the execution of Richard Charlton was surely not necessary. The people of the area believed Richard to be a good, kind man and that he had acted entirely out of character. Several people also wrote letters in his favour. The petition and the letters were taken to the MP for Newcastle, Mr T. Burt, with the wish that he would personally forward these to the Home Secretary, which he duly did. However, a letter was quickly received stating that the Home Secretary had carefully studied the case and could see no grounds to commute the sentence, and the execution would go ahead as planned on December the 23rd, 1875. Richard had several visitors during his time in Morpeth Prison, and one of the last was his mother and two brothers. It was said to be a very sad meeting, and as they left, Richard said that he hoped they would all meet again in heaven. It was stated that he had also specially asked for his brother to look after his son. However, this does not seem to have happened, as in 1891 he can be found living with his aunt Anne Robson at Gardner's houses. The night before the execution, William Marwood arrived at Morpa Station just as it was getting dark and was taken immediately to the prison where he would spend the night. This was often done to avoid people of the area coming into contact with the executioner before the hanging had taken place. Mr Marwood would also inspect the gallows before the morning. It was said that on this occasion they were placed on not on a platform as it was thought that Richard would be unable to walk up any steps. On the morning of the execution, Richard arose at around 5.30am and was attended by the prison chaplain, the Reverend Thomas Finch. It was said that some of the prisoner warders were more upset than Richard himself, but he seemed to be resigned to his fate. After a service in the chapel at around 7am, he was taken back to his cell to await the arrival of Marwood. Just before 8am, he was joined by the prison governor, Mr. Wookie, in his cell. Richard spoke to him and thanked him for his care and attention, looking after him for the several months that he had been at Morpeth Prison since his arrest. He had spent most of his time in the infirmary, and he felt that Mr. Wookie and his staff had been very kind to him. Immediately after this, William Marwood arrived and Richard was pinioned. 
This means that his arms would be tied at the wrist and he was led to the scaffold. I did read one report which stated that he had walked unaided, but I am more inclined to believe the many others which state that he was helped by one of the prison warders. The gallows had been placed next to the southwest wall of the prison, as this was to be the first execution in private, and it had taken some time to find the best place within the grounds that did not allow anyone to view from any of the higher vantage points around the prison. Richard had also needed help to step onto the gallows, and once there he still needed to be supported. It was said that Marwood worked as quickly as possible, placing the white cap over Richard's head and adjusting the rope. All those helping now stepped back and the signal was given and Richard fell. His death was said to be almost instantaneous. As the clock struck 8am, the black flag was flown above the prison walls to allow those gathered outside to know that the execution had taken place as the law required. After the usual time of one hour, the body was removed and placed into a plain wooden coffin, and this was later buried within the grounds of Morbeth Prison. Sarah and Richard's son Henry may not have been able to live with Richard's brother as he had hoped, but he did keep the child name. He went on to marry in around 1908, and it seems that he worked as a labourer and also a gardener. I did not find any details of any children, and he died in Northumberland in around 1950. This is another sad and tragic story where two young people lost their lives and a baby was left an orphan at less than three months old. This was also a very strange story. On the one hand, we have a man described by friends and neighbours and even the local vicar as kind, caring and inoffensive in nature, one even saying that a wife could not have found a better husband. And on the other hand, we have a man very much disliked by the family of the woman he married, and the suggestion that he had abused his wife so frequently that she had finally left him. But which version is the correct one? That is something we will probably never know. But it does seem to me that in buying the gun the previous day, he had planned to use it in some way against his wife. There seems to be no other reason for buying it, so it's hard to believe that he had acted in a moment of temporary insanity, or that he really was the nice man that his friends and neighbours believed. However, there was still no clear motive for killing his wife. But what do you think? Does buying the gun mean that he planned it all? Or was it really a moment of pure madness? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I do hope that you have found this sad and tragic story interesting and I do thank you all very much for watching and I do hope to see you all again very soon.